Okay, I'm going to start, even though <laughs> there's one person here, one in person and one on Zoom. Uh, maybe more people will just in. Otherwise, I guess you're watching the recording. <laughs> uh, it is recording, yes. Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, so, um, So once again, if we've got to you know this is the very last part of the transcendental analytic. You know, about to start the transcendental dialect. So the analytic of concepts now we have an analytic or at the end of the analytic of principles, namely. At the end of this weird, somewhat unexpected third section, uh, where we finish the first two sections of the schematism and the system of principles, and then there's this unexpected third section of phenomena and meaning. And then It has an even more expected appendix of the amphiboly. So you just call it the amphiboly, but it's the amphiboly of concepts of reflection. Isn't that not a full title? It's like that. I don't remember. Equivocal, the amphiboly of the pure concepts of, I don't know. Anyway. Basically, it's the amphiboly of the concept of reflection. Um, so, um, and I mean, I guess officially the appendix itself is rather short, but then there's a note to the appendix, and the note to the appendix is longer than the appendix. <laughs> so, uh, and like I signed almost all of this material. There's one thing at the end which of the table of nothing that I didn't include in the assigned reading for kind of following the tables of categories gives the four types of nothing. <laughs> um, which actually, even though Kant begins that section by saying it's not of great importance, I think it actually is kind of important, but it would be too much reading, and there was no way to attach it to the beginning of the next reading. So to decide to skip it. Um, okay, so what is this section about and what is, what is it doing here? I think there's kind of uh, two ways to approach it. Um, it's like the official answer, the official explanation of what this section is about um, which also, I think, uh, if you understood correctly, explains what it's doing here. Um, uh, which, you know, um, I'm going to go into, obviously, but roughly speaking, it's because I said last time, this section as a whole is about reflection. But that's why we're going to get something about the concept of reflection as an appendix to this section. Um, but there's also kind of an unofficial topic of the section, which is that it contains uh, Kant's response to Leibniz. Um, Actually, it's supposed to contain, I think, supposed to contain Kant's response to Leibniz and Locke. I mean, Locke only gets once mentioned once, 
um, kind of in passing, but uh, when he is mentioned, Kant says uh, that he basically just made the same mistake as Leibniz, only the other direction, so to speak. So there ought to be some way of going through this section and explaining uh, what Kant would want to say against Locke in each problem. Um, and just to make that more plausible, the list of four pairs of concepts of reflection essentially comes from Locke. And Kant doesn't say it, but this list of it's um, if people did take empiricists, if you took empiricists with me, I pointed this out. We got to the beginning of book four that Locke has a list of the four different types of uh, agreement of ideas that can be the basis of uh, judgments and therefore of knowledge. And that list of four types of agreement of ideas is basically the same as Kant's list of the four pairs of concepts of reflection. So, um, um, so it's like likely that it is possible to do that with Locke. I guess that way you're alive and it's first and then Locke. Um, but it's pretty hard. I don't know how to do it. I think um, it would start probably, this is something Locke says in the essay, um, Book two, chapter 27, section one. When we see anything to be in any place in any instant of time, we are sure, be it what it will, that it is that very thing and not another which at the same time exists in another place, how like and undistinguishable soever it may be in all other respects. And in this consists identity. When the idea it is attributed to very not at all. Wait. When the ideas it is attributed to very not at all from what they were that moment wherein we consider their former existence and to which we compare the present. The last part is uh, kind of hard convoluted Lockean syntax, but he's saying that, you know, identity, uh, there can only, uh, um, the whatever at a certain place at a certain time is definitely just that thing and not something else. And then if you follow it forward through time, that's where you get the relation of identity between the thing that was here at this time and the thing that is here at some other time. So I mean, without going into what Locke means by that, or whether Locke can make that work, it's uh, obviously, you know, it's close to what Kant is saying here about identity and difference. That identity and difference are based on, uh, um, for empirical objects, are based on their position in space. Um, so uh, I think you would have to, um, to, to like fill in the lock side of what the lock side that should be here, you would have to try to figure out exactly where Kant thinks that description in lock leaves something out, which presumably what it leaves out is somehow the rule of the, the role of the understanding in establishing identity and difference, right? Just as Leibniz is gonna, is ruling, is uh, leaving out the role of sensibility in establishing identity and difference. Anyway, that's um, um, that's all I'm going to say about Locke. About Leibniz, I'm going to talk in more detail if there's time. Um, but um, uh, but I do want to point out one thing in advance, which is that um, so according to Leibniz, what distinguishes a rational? So okay, so I think we established before that people just class, at least the people who have been here before didn't, have not had rationalists. Is that right? So you, like, so, you, so I can't assume you know much or anything about Leibniz, but uh, uh, according to Leibniz, what they're, 
you can kind of gather by things Kant says against him in this section. But like according to Leibniz, uh, uh, what they really are are uh, infinitely things called monads. And every monad is a simple incorporeal substance. It's like an angel. It's like a, it's very much like the way Thomas Aquinas understood angels. And I mean, not coincidentally, Leibniz actually refers to Thomas Aquinas when he talks about this. Um, so uh, there's like infinitely many of them everywhere, well, everywhere, but as Kant uh, points out when he discusses Leibniz, Leibniz thinks that the order of space is just a secondary and confused manifestation of a different kind of order that exists between monads. Uh, right, and the, the, the order that exists between monads has to do with the way they represent each other. So each one of these monads represents all the others. And that's basically like, the two things that each monad does is represent all the others and like will its own future states. <laughs> um, so that's what a monad in general is, but Leibniz says some of the monads are rational monads and the others are not. I mean, here, I mean, every, every angel is a rational angel. So obviously here he's departing from Thomas Aquinas, but so, like uh, most of the monads are not uh, rational monads, but some of them are. And which are the rational monads? So Leibniz explains it basically in terms of having self-consciousness. Um, he says a rational monad is a monad that has the right to say I. So, and he says that, that because of this self-consciousness, the most rational monads can come to an understanding of themselves and God, which I take to mean that basically a rational monad is able to carry out some version of Descartes' meditations. And it's not gonna be Descartes' version of Descartes' meditations because it's not gonna end up with Cartesian metaphysics. It's gonna end up with Leibnizian metaphysics, right? But it's um, but at least the early stages of it are going to be similar. Um, so um, so therefore, like the fact that Leibniz um, gets discussed in this section. I mean, when when Kant brings it up, he makes it sound like it's kind of like lucky coincidence. Oh, by the way, we can also talk about Leibniz here, right? But I think it's not a coincidence at all. Like somehow, you know, um, the fundamental difference between Kant and Leibniz must have to do with uh, the relationship between reflection and apperception. Right? Like, the um, the relationship between the right to say I or if, if I'm right that this is basically the beginning of the meditation and it's kind of short for the right to say I think right so like Kant puts that at the basis of at least the, the logical part of his system just as Leibniz is putting it at the basis of his system but uh, Kant is getting one kind of result, and Leibniz is getting another kind of result. And um, the, the problem must be uh, uh, that Leibniz is not right about what this allows you to, to do by, re by reflecting on your own uh, nature. So, um, so that, like, um, I, I don't think, like, Kant doesn't say that in so many words. All he does is go through the causes of reflection and, and see and say how 
uh, if you don't understand the difference in phenomena and noumena, you get you you fall into Leibniz's opinion, but he doesn't connect it back to the issue of reflection in general. That's anyway what I'm trying to give some hint about. Um, okay, having said all of that, I'm now going to go back to the official explanation, and then, like I said, if there's time at the end, then I think. In the last previous versions of this lecture, sometimes this is time, sometimes they're happy. But if there's time at the end, I'll go back into more detail and talk about uh, what Kamat says about Leibniz. And also, I mean, I think it's generally acknowledged that um, when thinking about Leibniz in this section, Kant is thinking especially about the uh, Leibniz Clark correspondence. So um, uh, Clark was, I remember this name now. Clark was the close associate of Newton. Um, basically, uh, Leibniz uh, carried on a debate via correspondence with Newton, but Newton didn't want to correspond with him directly. I mean, they weren't on good terms, right? Because Newton accused Leibniz of having plagiarized the calculus from him and whatever. So that, so uh, they didn't correspond directly, but I guess we know from, you know, from like manuscripts that, that Newton actually wrote parts of Clark's responses. So it was like basically a debate between Leibniz and Newton. Um, and uh, so like, has that in mind here, although he clearly knows some things about Leibniz or about Leibniz and Wolf that you couldn't get just out of that correspondence, right? So he's not, it's not like that's the only thing he's read, but he's thinking about that. And so at the same time as he's attacking Leibniz, he's defending point by point the possibility of Newtonian physics. That's kind of the background here also. So anyway, like I said, I will, um, uh, get back to that at the end if there's time. But for for now, I want to talk more about what, as I put it, is officially going on here. I mean, I don't know if you understand what I mean by official, but <laughs> like, um, you know, why there has to be a part of the system like this and would have to be even if you never heard of Leibniz. So, um, you know, it's just now. Um, so, um, so as I said last time, I think the section as a whole, or I just erased the, <laughs> the section as a whole, phenomena and noumena is essentially about the understanding's ability to set a limit to itself. Right, so, um, um, you know, it begins with a little summary of the analytic and then points to the thing that still needs to be said, that still needs to be said to respond to implicitly Hume or someone like Hume saying, well, um, okay. uh, Hume or someone like Hume saying, well, fine, you can prove, you know, the principle of causality. Let's say you can. What difference does it make? We would believe in it anyway. So, and Kant says, well, the one thing that under the empirical understanding can't do for itself is set its own limits. So the rest of the section is about how the understanding can set its own limits. Now, I mean, I think, I think this is the right way to put it, that uh, in the, the understanding has set its own limits already in the preceding part of the analytic, but it needs to be explained how the understanding can have the right to do that. And um, so, I mean, there's kind of two parts to that question. One, I got, I one is harder than the other, maybe, but. Um, and I, I, I tried to say what I could about it last time. I'm going to maybe say a few more things that are relevant to it this time, but 
you know, so the part that's harder is the part that I call critique of critique, right? Where you say, well, like, what are we even thinking about when we think about, quote, the understanding? Like, where, what kind of object is, or a constant, like, what kind of object is, um, and I said a bunch of kind of disconnected things about that last, but one of the things I said is that, like, for theoretical purposes, um, uh, those things must be powers of a body. <laughs> That's the only thing they can be. Um, uh, but I guess uh, the other part of it is yeah, it, so I like I think that part of it that thing that I just said is implicitly stated in this section, the amphibole, right? It's all about how we need the form of external sense to uh, apply the concepts of identity and difference of inner and outer, therefore to understand like how substances can affect each other and so forth. We need the form of external sense that is space to do all of that. Um, so, um, he doesn't quite come out and say, and therefore, if you think about our own faculties, we must be thinking about the faculties of, of a substance given an external sense. Um, but he comes pretty close to saying it, he implies it. And I think um, if you ask, why doesn't he say it more explicitly? Or also, if you ask, why haven't we heard about all this stuff until now in this appendix to this section that we didn't really expect to begin with? And then there's an appendix. Um, shouldn't we have heard about like this really important, apparently important list of concepts, the pure concepts of reflection? Shouldn't we have heard that about that like right away after the categories or something? So, um, so. Possibly the answer is obviously this. I can only say this very tentatively, but you know, possibly the answer is uh, Kant is worried about saying this, right? I mean, this is like materialism. This is this is like what Hobbes says about the fact of the mind, right? So I mean, Kant thinks that we uh, that's not the whole story. This is for theoretical purposes, and then there's the practical philosophy, which is uh, in which the story is quite different. Um, but both from the point of view of censorship and from the point of view of like damaging his readers, he may want to make it not that easy to see that that's what he's saying, if it's if it's true that that's what he's saying. So anyway. Um, that was kind of a digression, but but the other part of the question is if we say that the, the understanding sets its own limits, then we seem to be saying that the understanding can draw a line around the type of objects it can characterize phenomena and compare them to the type of objects it can't cognize, namely noumena. So it seems like if the understanding is able to draw a line around its uh, uh, the land it possesses, <laughs> right? It must actually, after all, have a title for this concept as well, the concept numa. And so it turns out the boundary wasn't really there because it can refer to numa. So I mean, this would be, I guess, like you'd have to look at this as a reduction. Right, I mean, it would show that the whole document is not self consistent. Um, so, like, the answer in the main section was that this, yes, we do have a title for the concept humana, but only in a negative sense, not in a positive sense, uh, which, as I tried to explain last time, means something like. And I think, you know, in the reading for this time, there's some more explicit statements of this very thing on Tom's part. But it means something um, 
we must be able to abstract from the concept of phenomenon without self-contradiction to a broader concept of objects in general. And um, so in that sense, we learn that phenomena are not all objects because all objects is a different and more abstract concept. However, um, we make that abstraction, we don't uh, gain any new positive like realm of like examples that we can supply. We're still only left with the one example we started with, the phenomenon. So as Kant says, like this is, this turned out to be a void space for our understanding. Or as he also puts it in the reading for today, uh, the understanding limits sensibility without thereby extending its own domain, right? Like the understanding draws a line around everything that can be given in sensibility, namely the realm of phenomena. And then uh, you might think it could only do that if it's standing out from the point of view of something bigger than that. Right, but the answer is no. It, 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 the understanding draws this limit, but it doesn't thereby get any new space for itself. Um, so, um, so this is how um, reflection. I mean, at least this is a first point of how reflection is somehow related to comparison. Um, right? Like the issue in here is how can we say that phenomena and noumena are different? Um, in what sense can we say that? And yet it seems like we have to be able to say that in order to reflect on ourselves, that is, in order for the understanding to draw a limit around its uh, the domain where it can actually be, where we can actually use it. Um, um, so in this appendix, then like Kant makes it clearer what his view about comparison in general is. And how uh, we should make it clear, although it's very hard to understand, how in general comparison is related to reflection. And when I say this is very hard to understand, I mean, like if you read the first few paragraphs of the Amphiboly, he keeps going back between reflection and comparison in a way that, that is very confusing. Um, but um, it's clear that somehow they're closely related, but it's hard to figure out exactly what he's saying about them. So, um, but to, to um, get some light on this, I'll say that, so first of all, um, there's, you know, uh, so there's one kind of, kind of comparison which Kant calls logical comparison, which at least at one point he says is the same as logical reflection. And logical comparison is the comparison of constants. So like, uh, Um, if you go through the list, I haven't, I'm going to write this up soon, pretty soon, I guess. But so if you go through the list of the pure concepts of reflection, um, like the first one is identity and difference. That's the easiest one to understand. Uh, like if you want it, you can compare two concepts to see if they're the same concept or are they different concepts. <laughs> um, so like 
how do you how do you do that? Well, you know, if they're the same concept, they must thinking of concepts now as lists of characteristics. So remember that what I said is a kind of simplified way of thinking about concepts, but it's so concept A consists of the characteristics A1, A2, A3, right? So think about like yellow, malleable, you know, soluble in aqua regia. And concept B consists of these characteristics. And if you want to compare them, well, just see that they have, have the exact same characteristics on both lists or not. Um, if they're the exact same list of characteristics on both, this then it's the same concept. Um, and if and if any of them are different, then it's different concepts, and that's the end of the story. So um, um, the other concept of reflection, I mean, like the next one, agreement and opposition, is relatively easy to understand too. Like, does is one of the characteristics of B, like if it turns out that B1 is equal to like not A1, like the negation of A1, then uh, these concepts are opposed. They can't both apply to the same thing without contradiction, for example. Right? So, um, uh, Whereas if there's not, if you don't find anything like that, then the concepts are in agreement, meaning, I guess, they could apply to the same thing without question. So, um, so that's logical comparison, but um, there's another kind of comparison, which is, I guess, in general, could be called objective comparison. where rather than compare the concepts, we're comparing the objects of the concepts. <laughs> um, and under this, I think there's two subcases. This, again, doesn't make all that clear. I mean, he, was, he mostly talks about logical comparison and transcendental comparison. But some of his examples are clearly about what you might call empirical comparison, right? So like I have the concept rain drop, and now I wanna know whether I'm applying it once or twice, basically. Like, are these two the same raindrop or different raindrops? I mean, I guess like it could also be objects of two different concepts and you can still ask the same question. You know, um, uh, you know, is this body the same as this dog or are they different? <laughs> right, so you have the concept body and the concept dog. And you're not asking, are they the same concept? Because clearly they're not. But you're asking about an object of each concept, whether it's the same as the object of the other concept or not. So, um, so, so that would be like empirical comparison. Um, um, so, um, Whereas transcendental comparison would be comparing the concepts um, Comparing concepts with respect to uh, the way they have objects, right? Like with comparing them with respect to their objective reality. Um, I mean, 
um, well, again, if you haven't had a rationalist, this won't help you very much, but I mean, Descartes does something like this in the third meditation where he says, um, all my ideas are like regarded subjectively are have the same degree of formal reality that is um they're all the same they're all just modifications of my mind but it says on the other hand my different ideas have different degrees of objective reality like for example my idea of a substance has more reality than my idea of an accident um, and of course, like the way that heads in the third meditation is that he then says that I have one idea that's the idea of the infinite, whose object has so much reality that, uh, it, that the, the object itself must exist if, my, if I have an idea of it. But like leaving aside that part of it, um, Kant, you know, says the same thing here about the logic compares concepts without asking where they come from, which is like kind of like uh, uh, what mode of being do they attribute to their object, or something like that, okay. or that or that's like correlated with that. So logic. Formal logic, general logic, compare, considers concepts without worrying about that. And therefore, from the point of view of logical comparison, they're all homogeneous. But from the point of view of transcendental comparison, we have to ask um, how is an object supposed to be given to this concept? And again, because remember, my claim is that transcendental. In general, uh, means having to do with objects in abstraction from like any empirical features, having to do with objects as such. Um, so transcendental comparison is compared. So, for example, if we compare the concept dog and the concept raindrop without taking into account any of the empirical characters that they attribute to their object, what's left to compare? Well, they're both uh, concepts of sensible objects. That is, they're both concepts of phenomena. Um. So, um, so as Kant says in the section, you know, the, the, the point of view of transcendental comparison is to ask in what place do these objects lie? Do they, uh, or that is, in, in what place do these concepts lie where the places are the like, different ways of referring to an object, of getting reference to an object. And the alternatives are that um, the object is given in sensibility or the object is given in understanding alone. Now it's confusing that he said that because um, you say, well, hold on a second aren't all our concepts going to turn out to be in here? And I think the answer is yes, <laughs> right? That is transcendental comparison is in itself like not going to be all that interesting because um, all it's going to show is that all our concepts belong in here and none of them belong. Um, but um, the possibility and nature of empirical comparison is going to turn out to depend on the result of transcendental comparison. Right? So, like, in order to understand the way the objects of, of the actual objects, that is, empirical objects um, of 
concepts. Well, I guess I shouldn't jump the gun and say that they're empirical, right? That to understand the way the actual objects of concepts can be compared to each other, you have to first place the concept in the right transcendental place. Okay, you have to um, realize that they're in here and not in here. So, uh, this kind of comparison must be possible. Um, we couldn't know objects at all if we couldn't apply, compare them, for example, with respect to identity and difference. So, but it presupposes this kind. So this is a kind of transcendental deduction here, so to speak. Trans there must be a way of doing the transcendental comparison too. And the transcendental comparison is basically what for we were calling reflection. Right? I mean, because the transcendental comparison is ends up meaning um, How do I have the ability to employ this concept, to apply this rule to a case? So it's a question about the nature of my cognitive factor. Um, So, uh, I mean, the criticism of Leibniz is going to be that he got this wrong and put our concepts in, in this space. And therefore, he reached wrong conclusions about how it must be possible to compare them. So, I mean, he went actually kind of the wrong direction as concepts he went from. Um, concepts to objects rather than objects to concepts. It is, I mean, we should say, look, how is it possible to compare objects? And then from that, we realize like what place they must be in or something like that. But Leibniz started off by assuming they're in this place and then said, well, this is how you must be able to compare. So like, um, but uh, so that belongs to the unofficial story. But as far as the official story goes, you can say, well, like come back to the question, how can we say that phenomena are different from human? And so uh, um, how can we make that comparison? And the answer is, well, like in this case, the sensible conditions that allow the comparison aren't there because we're trying to compare things that fall under those conditions, but things that don't. So, um, so in this case, all we can do is compare the constants. Um, and that's basically the same answer that was given in the main section. Right, that what all we're doing here is when we say these are different, all we're doing here is we're saying, like, you know, here's the concept phenomenon. It consists of A1 and A2. And here's the concept object in general. And consists of just A1. So they're not the same concept. Um, and this leads to the negative concept of the Numenon, right? The negative concept of the Numenon is um, since these aren't the same concept, uh, you know, I can add whatever I want to this one without contradicting that. However, I don't actually have anything to add. <laughs> That's why it's a negative concept of the noumenon. Um,
Um, And I mean, actually, I think the last thing I said, you can already hear how we can go down a whole table of conceptual questions, right? Like, how should we think of noumena as opposed to phenomena? Well, um, we can only think of them as opposed by negation. That is, you know, whatever the characteristics that noumenon have, if we have no idea what it could be, must be incompatible with this. <laughs> um, so it must like be or include like not this, right? But that doesn't tell us what it is. Um, but it does. It does show how we can, you know, we say we can say that these are different from each other. That uh, the same object can't be both. And I guess with. The other two as well. Uh, in this section, Kant does uh, several times, you know, the thing that, as I pointed out before, he often does, which is to like treat the easy cases explicitly and then leave the hard cases as an exercise. <laughs> <laughs> and so the the other two pairs of concepts of reflection are much harder to understand and deal with than the first pair. Um, So, you know, what that means is that, that, that this kind of like comparison of phenomena to noumena, I mean, it's, it kind of fits under this, it, but it's kind of a um, limiting case of this. I mean, that is literally a limiting case. <laughs> the case that draws the limit, okay? it's um, because we're comparing, we have an object on this. We don't have an object on this. So we're comparing this object to nothing, basically. Um, and I think that's why, as I said, at the very end of the transcendental analytic, there's all of a sudden this table of nothing. And the, the first item on the table of nothing, the example Kant gives of it is. But, um, for example, a Newman. <laughs> right. So, um, um, so, like, I think that's roughly speaking how this is related to the topic of the section of the whole. Now, uh, the question is whether it's possible to go back. And use that to understand that confusing stuff about the relationship between different kinds of reflection and different kinds of uh, comparisons. Um, I mean, right, so we're clearly talking about. I mean, we're clearly talking about two things the whole time. One is comparison and the other is reflection. And we're also, although this is not as clear until you get to the note of remark, I guess it's called the remark on the amphibole, right? But again, the remark is longer than the amphibole itself. Although it's quite repetitive, actually. It almost seems like he deliberately made it wrong. <laughs> but in any case, what's clear, what becomes clear in that remark is that another thing that we're talking about um, throughout all of this is place. Um, right in, in Greek, the word for place is topos. So, um, Todd uses this term topic. I mean, like study of places or a system of places. It's kind of like what we use the word topology for in some topics, right? Um, it's, uh, I mean, whereas I guess he would call 
the individual place on top us. Now, I mean, if I get involved in this, maybe not, except except to say one thing. So like a lot, Kant says a logical place, that every concept is associated with a logical place. So every uh, concept is associated with a logical topos. So I think we actually use the word topic there. Kant's, Kant's use is probably makes more sense, right? It's just like you use the word logic to mean like not a particular logos, but like the story, the theory of all the logoi, right? So um, but in any case, right? So that, that helps to understand what he means by a logical place. It's what we call a topic. Every concept is a topic, right? Like a topic for discussion. Right, so in, in that sense, it's a place. Uh, the place where, well, people sometimes say in logical space, right? But logical space isn't really space, you know? Like there are no different directions in logical space, for example. Right? So, um, but it does have different places and each place is something you could talk about that is a topic or a concept. So, um, um, so it's not exactly clear how these three things are supposed to be related, is what we're saying. Um, and um, you like, on the one hand, you can kind of see vaguely that. Um, The comparison of two representations is going to somehow involve um, relating them back to the faculty or faculties of which they are acts, right? So the representation is, um, right, we have a faculty that is a power or potentiality of representation, and then there are actual representations, which are the acts of that faculty. So now we want to compare two of them in some way. Um, so here's the first one and here's the second one. And what I'm saying is um, uh, that you can understand somewhat why comparing them is going to mean somehow looking back at the faculty, which they both actualize. Um, um, and I think like one way of seeing this is to say that like two things are comparable only if this is a little bit of jargon. I mean, it's jargon that Kant himself uses here, although whether he's using it exactly this way, I'm not sure. But you say two things are comparable only if they're determinations of the same determinable. Right, like so, there must be some common ground of possibility, um, which both of these things are derived from, and then you can ask whether they're the same one or not. Um, and so. Uh, all right, I don't remember why I haven't given this up yet. Do I have room for it over there? I have room for it over here. Um, so see, I have to use the part of the blackboard that you can see on the screen. All right. Um, Identity and difference, agreement and opposition, inner and outer. So, you know, uh, like this is this 
No, maybe I should. I mean, I was going to talk about how exactly to correlate this with locks pairs because the, the terms except at the beginning are not the same. But I, I think if you if you look and see what Kant says these comparisons are about and compare them to what Locke is talking about, you'll see that I'm right that it's basically the same list, but I won't get into that. So and the last one is matter and form. And um or should be the other way. The list. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's kind of weird. I expect it to be form and matter, but instead it's matter and form. Well, but in any case, what I was going to say is that, you know, what I just said about how representations have to be compared, um, uh, you, you could say that identity and difference has to be in what? Well, it has to be in like the uniform, uh, the unified form to which a manifold of manner, matter corresponds. Um, so because the, the single form that all these representations have in common is exactly this faculty. Right, remember that's how I explained like how what it means to say that space and time are the form, the pure forms of intuition. It means that space and time are our faculties of internal and external sense. And every actual empirical intuition is, so to speak, composed of that one form and something else like sensation. Um so, and the sensation is or corresponds to is the effect of the object, which is the matter. So, um, so when we ask, like, whether these are sensations. Uh, or whether these are intuitions of the same or different objects. Um, so we're asking about identity and difference. The place in which we, we, we do the comparison is the unified form or the, the, the one form that all the representations have in common. We're asking like, you know, um, is, is this the same actualization of that capacity of representing an object, or is it a different? So, um, um, so right away you can see um, that, that not only does comparison relate to reflection, but place is going to come into it, and um, in the case of objects of external sense. So, um, and like, remember that since only substances are only given an external sense, in some, in, in some, some sense, <laughs> in some way of understanding, like all phenomena are objects of external sense. Like as far as their substance is concerned, they're all objects of external sense. So when we compare them to see that they're the same or different, substantially, we're comparing them in space, which is the one form of that all external intuitions have in common. 
So like literal place is, an, is actually is an example of what we're calling place here. And again, in some ways, the only actual example, right? Like the, the empirical comparison of objects is the only time we actually compare actual objects, right? Every actual object is empirical. Everything else about transcendental objects and transcendental comparison and whatever is somehow about like a, a metaphorical way of talking about our capability of representing empirical objects. So that like the actual comparison we do is as far as identity and difference goes. And again, so now you can see that Kant and Locke are pretty close to agreeing with each other here. That when we ask whether two objects are identical or, di are, or different, um, in the actual empirical case, what we're asking is, are they in the same place at the same time or are they in different places at the same time? If they're in the same place, they're the same object. And if they're in different places, they're different objects. Um, but these other types of, of comparison, um, These other types of comparison also somehow involve place, right? So um, Kant says that the transcendental topic that is for, um, you know, finding out what are the transcendental places that concepts can be. Um, and, um, um, and there's only two transcendental places. <laughs> there's a place in this place, and as Todd says, this place is a void place, right? There's nothing here for us. We can't represent anything. Um, but uh, it's still a version of the same thing in the sense that, like, if instead of the form of external sense here, you, you think of this as the form of an intellect in general, without yet deciding whether it's discursive or intuitive. So we're at, so again, it's this kind of abstraction, right? We don't actually know any examples of intellects that are not discursive. But uh, we can separate the concept of intellect from the concept of discursivity. Like we can abstract from the discursivity of our intellect and just leave the concept of intellect, which is what? It's the concept of active representation. That is representation of the object by a principle that's in me rather than by a principle that's in the object. We can take that by itself and abstract from the fact that, that in us, uh, something else is always needed to complete the reference, namely sensation, right, sensibility. So we can abstract from that and just consider the nature of intellect in general, and then we can compare our representation of phenomena, which is the representation of, um, so which is the representation of a possible object, right? Because like we've abstracted from all the particular empirical characteristics. So it's, we don't know what object this is anymore. It's the transcendental object, so to speak, right? So that's not exactly what kind of the transcendental object in this text. So maybe that's the way I understand it. But anyway, so this is like the object of our uh, cognitive faculties in general. It, that is, it's, you know, phenomenon in general. And we can compare it to the concept numenon. And the concept numenon you know, we don't represent any object by it, but we can still see that it's a, um, it is or would be a different actualization of the faculty of intellect in general in the abstract. And so uh, that's the place which we're dividing into phenomena and you know, um,
it's interesting to compare this to what Kant says about literal void space around the universe in the first antinomy. I think the first antinomy is even part of the reason for this course, so maybe I shouldn't say anything more about that. But uh, it's kind of surprising. There's something different about it. It's because there, Kant says that. Uh, uh, and 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 there Kant is disagreeing with Locke. Locke says that we know that that the world is uh, surrounded by an infinite inane, okay, an infinite emptiness. Um, whereas uh, um, Kant, they are basically agreeing with Leibniz, although so maybe not for the same reason, says uh, we can't conceive of the world as that's contained in a space that has nothing. Uh, but in this transcendental case, we can talk about the world, right? Like this is the world transcendentally considered, <laughs> as opposed to empirically considered, namely just as with respect to what type of object it is, namely a phenomenon, right? And for the world transcendentally considered, we can think of it as such situated in an empty space. Um, all right, sorry, I know that probably wasn't very helpful, but um, um, so the thing that's a little hard to, oh, and by the way, I, so I should point out if this isn't obvious or if people haven't noticed this from the text, that, that these show with the, with the four categories. Right, I mean, Kant indicates that, I mean, actually what Kant draws a direct connection between is the concepts of reflection and the table of judgments. So he says, um, before constructing any, ob any objective judgment, we compare the concepts to find in them identity of many representations under one concept with a review with a view to universal judgments, difference with a view to particular judgments, agreement with a view to affirmative judgments, opposition with a view to negative judgments, etc. Right? So that etc. must be um, um, inner with a view to categorical judgments outer with a view to hypothetical judgments. Matter, although again, I feel like they're switched. But if this order is right, matter with, with a view to uh, problematic judgments, form with a view to assertoric judgments. But I mean, but since the table of categories is itself connected by the metaphysical deduction to the table of judgments, you can write the four headings of the categories here. Um, other questions about what I just said? Was that clear when you were reading it? Maybe. <laughs> All right. Oh, so, uh, um, okay, so like I just said, you know, roughly why, how comparison, reflection, and place or location are like related to each other. Um, um, it's a little hard to see though, and I think this is the, well, besides the fact that he seems to shift terminology at some point, like one of the hardest things to understand about the, that stuff at the beginning of the section is, um, I 
Right. I guess so. The, the question is, why does the why does the kind of comparison that Kant says we have to carry out in order to have any judgment ever? Why does that require transcendental reflection? I mean, I guess like you might think something of it like transcendental reflection um, is required to understand the possibility of comparison in general, right? And that's what I was just talking about. How is it that we're able to compare two objects of sensibility to see whether they're the same or different? Um, uh, transcendental reflection can like by by tracing our sensible representations to their roots in our faculties and uh um which i mean which isn't a long path right i mean it's just it's just noticing what their pure form is whatever noticing means to them but um so by tracing our representations to their path to their source in our faculties transcendental reflection can explain um, like how the comparison is possible. But Kant seems to say that comparison itself requires reflection, right? So he says, um, um, An examination. This is on uh, B three sixteen on page. Uh, 276 in Kemp's note. An examination, that is, the direction of our attention to the grounds of the truth of a judgment, is not indeed required in every case. For if the judgment is immediately certain, for instance, the judgment that between two points there can only be one straight line, see, that's, you know, we make just the case of literal space again. This is space in the form of external sense. These are the two representations. Like the way the form of external sense makes the comparison possible is that um, again, like the pot is involved the possibility of a triangle. Where, where am I? Well, I'm at this point. I'm at this. I'm at the apex of the triangle. So here, like, is one of the places. Like, if you were if you think about it, you realize that this section implies that I am an, uh, an object of external sense, right? But. Where is my faculty of sensibility? It's here. <laughs> so, but anyway, um, you know, so this like involves the fact that things in two different directions are not, can't be the same. But I just, I don't know if it's, if, if it's really connected with time. But the, the, the example, Kind of using your te the text has to do with the third part of the triangle, right? Like you know you can close the triangle off because between these two different points there has to be exactly one straight line. Um well um anyway, be that as it may, let me get back to reading this. Um an examination that is the direction of our attention to the grounds of the truth of a judgment is not indeed required in every case. For if the judgment is immediately certain, 
For instance, the judgment that between two points, there can only be one straight line. There could be no better evidence of its truth than the judgment itself, right? So if you, you know, if you're making the judgments between two points, there can only be one straight line, um, or the judgments, it's the same thing can't lie in two different directions at the same time. Those are like the two parts of the, the judgment that a triangle is possible, basically. Like, if you're making that judgment, you don't have to, uh, don't have to in the sense that it's like not your epistemic duty to examine the grounds of the truth of that judgment. Because Kant says the judgment is immediately certain. So, I mean, I don't know exactly what that means, but it, I mean, that is, I know what it means, but I don't know exactly how to relate it to the picture or something like that. But, you know, he's saying that uh, there isn't something more certain you can give as the grounds. So there's no reason to, to like require you to give grounds for the judgment in this case. Um, all judgments, however, and indeed all comparisons require reflection. So, I mean, if, if you stop there, it's not clear what kind of reflection we're talking about. Because again, there's like logical reflection. And I guess there's also empirical reflection, although he doesn't talk about that here. Um, but, um, except again, well, he does talk about it in some places, right? When he's talking about why Leibniz thinks that monads must uh, have an inner sense that's like ours. It reveals a series of representations. Um, but I mean, I think like, if you try to figure out what Hahn will say about our reflection instead, again, it's that when we reflect on, when we, when, when we reflect on the object of our inner sense, we realize that it's not a substance. Um, and yet uh, it's a series in time and it requires a substance with respect to which that series can be determined. And so that substance must be an object of external sense. So like this empirical reflection is like basically comes down to what I was just saying before, where is my faculty of sense? It's here <laughs> in space. I'm sorry, I've drawn space in two different ways here, but. <laughs> Because it's unavoidable. <laughs> but uh, so uh, so anyway, so he says that every judgment requires reflection. You're not too clear what reflection he means, but then he says that is distinction of the cognitive faculty, distinction or um like like uh, differentiation of the um, cognitive faculty to which the given concepts belong. That's that's transcendental reflection, right? And he's saying every judgment, not every judgment requires examination. That is directing your attention to the grounds of its truth. But every judgment requires reflection. That is determining the cognitive faculty to which the objects compared belong. So um, that's kind of weird because it sounds like every time we form a judgment, like all gold is yellow or um, uh, chocolate is bad for dogs or, you know, um, uh, these aren't the same raincoat. Like every time we form a, a judgment like that, it, we're, we must at least in the sense of we should do a little bit of transcendental philosophy right there on the spot and be like, oh, I see, uh, I'm a discursive intellect. And so therefore, and chocolate is bad for dot. Well, I mean, it's not therefore, right? Again, it's not the grounds of truth, but it's the grounds of like, it's understanding how the comparison that makes the judgment possible, um, where the comparison takes place. 
So, um, um, So I think, I mean, obviously, like, he can't win that, right? I mean, it's like, I mean, he said himself at the beginning of the book that transcendental philosophy can never become popular, right? He's not, he, he doesn't mean that everyone should, like, you know, think about all the things that he mentioned in Phenomena and Humana before they make any judgments. But, um, uh, I think he does mean um, um, We have to understand the the transcendental place that our concept is in in order to be able to use it in a judgment. Um, so, um, so like you know, suppose you're making a universal judgment. Uh, what example should I use here? I don't want to use an analytic type. Let's say all bodies are heaven. Let me just say something like all cinnabar is talking. And suppose again, I feel very uncomfortable about these examples because Kant says that empirical concepts don't have definitions. He says that in the doctrine of the method. We're not going to get to that part, but um but, uh, but it's hard to talk about this without using examples like this. It's as far as talk, suppose toxic is not part of the definition of cinema. But we judge based on experience that all cinema are toxic. So, um, so this is a universal judgment. And as Kant says in that little list, you know, we compare the concepts with respect to identity in order to form a universal judgment. Now, when he says we compare the concepts with respect to identity, like, um, he can't mean the logical comparison of the concepts. I mean, those are the words he uses, right? Let me, let me read that part again. Um, before constructing any objective judgment, we compare the concepts to find in them. We compare the concepts to find in them identity of many representations under one concept with a view to universal judgments. So it sounds like he's saying, in order to make a universal judgment, we compare these concepts to see if they are identical. But of course, that can't be right. Like, if these concepts are identical, then this judgment is analytic. In fact, it's what's called a, strictly speaking a tautology, right? Like all cinnabar is cinnabar. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, so we definitely don't make universal judgments by seeing that two concepts are identical. 
Um, so the identity, you know, um, the identity is um, the identity of the object. So, um, to make a universal judgment, um, We have to regard all the objects of cinnabar as identical. And then we can compare that identical object of cinnabar to the concept of Hox to see if the concept of Hox applies to it. Right. I mean, so if the concept of toxic doesn't apply to that identical object of the concept cinnabar, then um, uh, it's not true that all cinnabar is toxic. Doesn't necessarily mean that all cinnabar is not toxic, right? Because we have another way of representing the object of cinnabar as everywhere different using this concept of reflection, when we represent it as everywhere different, we can then ask, does the concept toxic apply somewhere to that self-different object of cinnabar, that is, is some cinnabar toxic? But, but staying with the universal judgment, which is usually the easiest one to understand, so we, you know, so we need to somehow regard the concept, the object of the concept cinnabar as all the same. Um, um, so, like, what is the same as what? I mean, it's, uh, of course, logically speaking, all the same. Because it's all the objects of the same concept, cinema, right? So it's all in the same logical place. It's the same topic. Right, so you can talk about cinnabar without asking which cinnabar you're talking about because you're just you're, all you need is to have the concept. But um, but in order to compare these concepts with a view to forming a universal judgment, um, you can't stop with that because from this concept, you can never tell whether the concept applies to its object or not. Unless the unless the judgment is analytic. Um, um, so you, what you need here is not the unity of the concept, but the unity of the object. So that, I mean, no, so that's the category of unity, but like how does the category of unity get applied to the matter? Well, um, so, you know, I need to um, regard the manifold ways I'm affected by this object as all one. So, um, I need to know where the manifold is. <laughs> that is, I mean, I need to know where each item of the manifold is. So I can, you know, like say the object of cinnabar is all of these, this whole manifold. And not anything else. I guess I need more than one dimension to draw this or something, but or maybe not. But here's how we can draw. So, uh, 
So I need to know where each one of these things is. But in order to know where each one of these things is, I need to know like what kind of places could they be. That is, I need to know the transcendental place of those objects. And um, and Kant says that you know, although by abstraction you can see that this isn't necessary, it isn't conceptually necessary. It's necessary for us. The only answer is that these things are infinite. Right? And so these different places are different places in space. And when we regard all cinnabar as one, we're saying something like, as far as you go with cinnabar, <laughs> okay? Like now, of course, cinnabar is all in one contiguous place, right? There's some here, and there's some there, and some there. But you know, um, but still, in some sense, this is all one place. Um, I mean, in some sense, this is the only way we can talk to differentiate places. What makes two different places different? The fact that we apply two different concepts. To them. Um, I, I mean. Sorry, that's not the right way to put it. But no, I should put it this way. What makes like what can make something in one place rather than a bunch of places? Like what right? Like what what allows me to regard this whole place as one place? And this is another place. Right? Like, how can I draw this line? This is the problem that they cart. Famously has real trouble solving. Well, I can't you guys get to take that. But <laughs> Descartes can't figure out how to solve this problem. And the monads, Linus's monads are supposed to be our part of this solution to the problem. Like Descartes says that all bodies have an extension, it's modes. So they have size and a shape and a motion and whatever. But then the question is size and shape and motion of what? Right, like so, you know, Descartes says this is a different body from this one because they're moving in different directions. But what's moving? Okay, like what's the difference when this one is over here? Because all the bodies have, you know, so um, so the answer must be that somehow we're able to apply a concept to everything here, and we're not allowed able to apply that same concept here. Right, so like this is a piece of cinnabar that's next to something else. <laughs> so, like when we talk about the place of all cinnabar, you know, of course we can't represent it all at once, which is precisely why these judgments are never strictly universal in the set and that's right. Like there's always some parts of the place of cinnabar that we haven't looked at. We can't rep this this place is is at least potentially infinite. We don't, you know. So uh um, or at least I mean maybe I shouldn't call it infinite, but it's not we can't represent it as a totality. We can only represent relative totalities like this piece of cinema. But it is one place, it's the place of the concepts. And when we make this judgment, we're saying. Everywhere in this place where cinnabar is, you'll find the toxic of Um And <laughs> the two minutes left, all I can say is, um, and similarly for all the other concepts of reflection, <laughs> right? I'm doing even worse than Kant here. Um, but um, I guess rather than try to say more than that, about that, I will. I, I will go back and just like briefly say one thing about how, you know, like a little bit about how then Kant's Leibniz goes wrong. So, right, like Leibniz thinks, um, according to Kant, that uh, uh, the objects of our cognition, cognition are human. That is, they're the object of, a, of our intellect alone. So, um, but he knows just like Kant that 
um, in order to um, make judgments about the objects of our cognition, we must be able to compare them. For example, with respect to identity and difference. Now, like, so how would, according to Kant, how would an intuitive intellect compare its objects to each other? Answer, we don't have the slightest idea, <laughs> right? Not using these concepts of comparison. <laughs> these are related to the categories. The categories are the form of discursive intellect. So, you know, we don't know. But Leibniz, like not realizing the problem he's got into, into himself here, thinks, well, let's look at our intellectual representations and see how we compare them. Meaning he like illegitimately um, uh, like puts logical comparison in the place where we need objective comparison. Right, see, this is the only way we can compare concepts without sensibility is, is to compare them logically. But Leibniz says sensibility is just like confusion or whatever, so that can't be relevant. So how do we compare objects? We must compare them by comparing the concepts. So like, for example, how can you tell the two things that, what are like, what does it mean when you say the two things are, are different? It means that you you have different concepts of them. right, and that and again, this is just the first example, but this this is the first example of the Leibnizian principle that Kant um, claims to explain uh, origin of the identity of indiscernibles. Right, the identity of the discernible says that no two things can have exactly the same characteristics. That's one of the principles of Leibnizian metaphor. That's one of the things that makes monads, that's that's what makes monads infinitely complicated. Okay, and like each one is its own lowest species. So um, Kant says, you know, this is just a mistake from imagining that we're it's 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 Really, Leibniz has really got himself into a contradiction there because he's imagining that we're intuitive intellect, but we're using discursive concepts. <laughs> so he's, and, and the conclusion he reaches is that there can't be two qualitative, like identical things in different places. And um, That rules out the idea of continuous matter. Basically, like this is this is the first place where uh, um, Leibniz seems to make Newtonian physics impossible. Because right, continuous matter means that it's qualitatively identical throughout some region. And Leibniz is saying that's nonsense. Okay, that's. Uh, Gone over again. That's more than I had time for, but uh, I'll see you next week. Oh, everyone's gone on Zoom. <laughs>